Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there. Hello and welcome to Capes on the Couch, where comics get counseling. I'm Anthony Sitko. And I'm Dr. Issues. This is issue number 71, The Tick. So, fun, light, airy. Ha ha, we're going to joke about this one. There's going to be lots of levity, because there was no joking in the last episode. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I needed this. Yeah, I think we both do. So, uh, real quick, uh, this week's plug is for the perfect package podcast chad and dave each get five picks to make the perfect whatever the topic is the perfect celebrity government the perfect first date what have you and uh, i will be guesting on an upcoming episode so um we haven't quite worked out the date or the topic yet but uh, i will be a guest on that show and so you can find them at p3show.com it's very very entertaining uh not safe for work language um but uh Everybody gets to to decide who put together the better package for, I think they did Super Bowl halftime show. Nice. So they get, um, it, it gets very interesting because you can pull stuff out of thin air. And what I like about their show is that they don't know what the other one picks. Nice. In advance. Yeah. So you will get them picking something and then the other person has to scramble. Oh, to, I see. Because, you know, yeah. it's, it's only one shot. Right. So can't, yeah, can't do the same thing. You, Got can't, it. you can't both pick the same thing. So then oh, man. if Chad picks something, then Dave has to come up with something to replace that. Nice. So it's very, very fun. I thoroughly enjoyed their uh, their celebrity government. I would have blown them both out of the water because I forget who of them had the rock for secretary of defense. Mm. And I would have picked him as the president. Yeah. So like right off the bat. Right there. You're, yeah. You're right set. off the bat. I was like, well, I'm starting with the rock as president. Yep. And you could do a hell of a lot worse than Dwayne Johnson. But so you can tell already that the mood of this episode is very different than the last one. This one is a lot looser. It's a lot freer. And that's because we're talking the tick because Brian wanted us to do the tick. Thank goodness. Now, I will say, and we're going to, I'm going to get into this a little bit in the background. We talk all the time on the show about the fact that we focus on comic book versions of characters. And even if they've been portrayed in other forms of media, we key in on the comics. Well, the tick is a little, a little different, different, not, not very easy to find comic information on the tick. Right. Because at least digitally. Yeah, I'll put it that way. Yeah, let's let's be real here. If you know the tick, there is a very good chance that you know him from the cartoon. And if you don't know him from the cartoon, you probably know him from the live action. And if you don't know him from the live action, you know him from the other live action. So one way or another, you probably didn't get introduced to the tick through the comic directly. That's just my guess. I think that's a safe bet. I know for a fact Brian did not. And I'm willing to venture probably... 90% of the listening audience, if not more, has, I don't want to say they've never read a Tick comic, but they were not, as you said, introduced to the character through the comics. Because the Tick was created by Ben Edlund in New England Comics Newsletter number 14, July, August 1986. He was originally the mascot for the newsletter for a comic store. Yeah. Black and white. (laughs) Everything was hand done. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he got his own comic series in 1988. Yep. And there have been some revisions and updated newer versions of the comic in the ensuing decades. I know Colin Bunn, who I managed mm-hmm. to interview during New York Comic Con, did a short series maybe mm-hmm. about two years ago, two, three years ago or so. Mm-hmm. Very brief indie comic series but everything is basically distributed through the new england comic store yep so you have to go to the new england comic store website to get your comics because they own the character yep and so unless you're going to pay money for the collections of these issues they're not really readily available digitally right which 
for the sake of convenience is how Doc and I read our comics. We have Marvel yep. Unlimited. We read, you know, through the DC Universe yep. app. Well, that's how we get our comics, just because to go out and buy all of these comics, floppies, month to month, that would get week me to week. Is, that would get me divorced, basically. I'm just going to put it out there. Yeah, I'm already, I have to scale back my pull list on my comic uh, on my my weekly or bi-weekly <laughs> trips to the comic shop because I'm spending far more money at the comic shop lately than I care <laughs> to. And I'm realizing now that this is getting a little out of hand. But I digress. So what I've been able to glean together from my research and then understanding of and reading of the character and then through the rest of his iterations in popular media is so so it all sort of ties together and the essence of the character essentially remains largely the same throughout his various depictions but the original comic version of the tick he is a nigh invulnerable superhero and by the way if you go on tv tropes uh nigh invulnerability was named for the tick because that's basically his superpower <laughs> is that he is quote nigh invulnerable mm-hmm. so he escapes from a mental institution in his debut and he cannot remember anything from his life before becoming the tick. So he lives in the city. That's what it's called. The city Mm -hmm. where absurd heroes and villains abound. And they're basically all parodies of every superhero you've ever heard of. Yep. Except they are nowhere near as cool or as skilled. Right. Both the heroes and the villains. It's goofy, absurdist, And frankly, the comics of what I've been able to read, most of the comic hero, most of the comic stories don't really involve the tick doing superhero-y type stuff. Right. It's slice of life. Right. With some superhero-y stuff thrown in. Right. In in other words, we've talked before about the differences between how DC portrays superheroes versus how Marvel portrays superheroes. This takes it way beyond that and just says, no, these are regular people. And he basically would be at a cocktail party and it's, oh, what do you do? Yeah, yeah I'm a, I, I wear a costume. I'm a superhero here and there. Yeah. So how about this weather? You know, just, just as you said, slice of life, average people that happen to be in these circumstances. So for a job, he takes a job at the Weekly World Planet newspaper, working alongside Clark Oppenheimer, a.k.a. the Caped Wonder. Yes, this entire thing is a giant Superman pastiche, and they lean into it hard. Yep. yep. So one of his allies and his eventual best friend is Arthur, an accountant in a moth suit. Although I made the same mistake everybody did when I first saw the Tick commercials. I thought Arthur was meant to be a, a rabbit. Everybody thinks Arthur is a bunny. Arthur doesn't have any powers other than the suit. He's just incredibly nerdy and way more intelligent. He is the straight man to the tick. And so, uh, and in all of the iterations, you have the tick and Arthur. And then most of the characters change because licensing issues, this, that, and the other. So you always have the tick, and you always have Arthur. Right. Everybody else is yeah, up in the air. Yeah, instead of the Flater Mouse, you get Batman well. Instead of, uh, well, never mind. You know, I, I I think I could just go, like, shot for shot with each character, but that's not the point of this. So yeah. Go ahead. So the tick is oftentimes fun and oblivious. He can get serious if the situation arises. And in one particular issue, his ally Oedipus, who is basically an Electra pastiche because Electra, Oedipus. Oedipus yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so read she, a book psychiatric stuff okay anyway so she gets stabbed he he just goes blank he goes almost into a fugue state he attacks the ninjas responsible he single-handedly destroys their lair all the while just repeating over and over again this isn't supposed to be happening this isn't supposed to be happening it's not supposed to happen like this it's not supposed to happen like this he he goes dark yep so it's later revealed at one point that he was married but separated due to the superheroing and also his inability to conceive a child or or the couple's inability to conceive a child caused a strain on the marriage. Huh. We don't know all the details, but um, 
So the tick kind of takes a laissez-faire attitude towards discovering his past. Like he knows he can't remember anything about who he was before the tick, but he's like, meh, whatever. Arthur seems more intrigued by it than the tick does. So my, again, my exposure to the tick was through the 90s cartoon. Same. And then I watched one or two episodes of the Patrick Warburton live action series. Yeah. I have not yet seen any of the Amazon Prime series with Peter Serafinovitz. Same. <laughs> so this is what we're working on. Having said that, I do feel that my understanding of the character is fairly solid. There's not a whole lot of depth to him. I'm just putting it that way. That's what Patrick Warburton said, actually. Directly. Just yeah. this, this character, you just... Go ahead and treat him like he is experiencing lots of different things for the first time. And you'll pretty much get it right. So the first issue is the amnesia about his pre-superhero life. That cannot be easy to deal with. And it's it's touched on briefly that if he gets hit in the head, he'll have like a flash or he'll he'll have the occasional you know, reference. There's one issue I read where he gets hit with some psychedelic drug powder and he starts speaking French and he's alluding to these things that he's not con he's not cognizantly aware that he's referencing this past life. But Arthur, who is alongside him, goes, How do you know French? And and how are you talking about all these things? And the tick is just sort of like, well, whatever. I don't know. And Arthur's like, no, something's happening. This is indicating that you're remembering stuff, but it's been suppressed or whatever. So the amnesia about the pre-superhero life, what impact does that have on somebody or or strong amnesia like that? We'll just put it that way in, in a general sense. Well, the good news is, is that is not as common as we would like to think based on media descriptions. Uh, but now, having said that, there are people that legitimately have periods of time that they don't remember. It often has to do with being in comas. So from that standpoint, I'll, I'll go ahead and give some credence to it. But we, in general, like to have our, I like to say, complete narrative, our full story. And we know for a fact that we have to rely on other people for early childhood. We're not going to remember things in general. I know there are exceptions. We're not going to remember things in general for the first few years of our life. From there, though, we're going to start to develop things in bits and pieces. And no matter what someone says, I know we all say, I remember it clear as day. No, you don't. You remember many vivid emotional points that have now indelibly been left on your psyche that you're going to recall on a more frequent basis than other points of your life. I know that there are rare exceptions where people say they remember every little bit of what they did, you know, photographic memory, whatever you want to call it. That's incredibly rare, and it usually has to do with one aspect of a person's life. Someone saying that they can remember every meal they ever ate, that's fine. Don't ask them about every movie that they saw. In other words, I'm, I'm trying to poke holes in some of the things that people think about when it comes to perfect memory in, in the first place. So we all have, honestly, a huge part of amnesia for what we do. And, and it's a good thing that we do. We don't need to remember every single negative thing that has happened or every single thing that has ever ticked us off. Like, for example, Anthony, I want you right now to recall every single time you got so upset you developed road rage while you were driving. Every single time, all at once, right now, go. Um, I don't recall that that's ever happened. Okay, good for you. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but I'm just saying in general, there are things that are always going to evoke responses in us. And we like to acknowledge them in the moment, process them for what they are and move forward. The Tick has this pretty much backwards. He ends up at times processing things after they've happened and then develops an emotional response that may or may not be appropriate to what he experienced. And the fact that he doesn't remember anything beyond being the tick as an adult indicates that he may or may not have actually learned any of the lessons that he was supposed to when he was younger. You can't rely on experience if you don't have any. And if you try to do things from scratch when you're supposed to already know something, then you're probably going to do a novice job at it. 
And so even the fact that he can't rely on other people to tell him the things that have happened. In other words, what we used to what we usually call jogging your memory, he can't rely on cues because no one is around to give him cues. So he starts off with what I call the worst version of a blank slate you could have. It's it's a horrid tabula rasa. It's the idea that you don't have the background either let's say culturally, spiritually, emotionally, academically, any of the things that you would rely on as a person to get through certain situations. You have to piece it all together and hope that people think it's the right thing. I'm going to make an, an allusion to another show where a character had to do this sort of thing. You remember Quantum Leap? Yeah. Okay. Same premise, though. You are now placed as a full-functioning human being with all of the expectations and circumstances that anyone else would have, but life didn't stop for you to read up on what's supposed to happen. They're just expecting you to do it the way that it's supposed to be done. So forget the dramatics of whether or not you remember what your childhood was like, whether it was abusive, whether it was enjoyable, or or the things that had common interests. When did you learn how to cook? When did you learn how to dress yourself? When did you learn that people actually have emotional responses to what you say, and if you tick them off, no pun intended, they're going to react to you? So I know in theory, I can get into the dramatics of not having all of those things developed and going through stages of development. I'll get to that later. For now, I'm just looking at it from a practical standpoint. How do you fill out? Because we're coming up on tax season. How do you fill out a tax return? It asks you, what did you do? How, you know, how long have you done it? What, you know, what have you earned? All that stuff, like just the basics, all of those things. I don't know how you get a passport. When were you born? What was it? I mean, who are your parents? Well, all those things, just the basics of life that we know we need to do everyday tasks you don't have. So every day is a potential struggle. In other words, someone like the Tick more than likely would have been ended up homeless on the street if we're talking real life. You just cannot function this way. Now, naturally, we're talking about what's more likely suppression as opposed to repression, because if it were repression, then it, it wouldn't ever come out because there was a reason it wouldn't be around. But in this case, it's something that was just so deep down that at some in some strange way, his brain literally said, OK, take all this other stuff and dump it. You don't need any of this but you still need to know how to walk. You still need to know how to coordinate well enough that you can tie, well, darn it, Tick doesn't wear shoes. Well, you get the point. To put on the suit, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that he still has those formal basics, but doesn't have any of the other information that we would expect an adult to have, that tells me that type of complete compartmentalized amnesia, I mean, it's a great story. It's not real, but it's it, it's it's a fantastic setup for a comic book character that's hilarious. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. So the next one is the attachment to Arthur. And this is evidence no matter what iteration of the character there is. He always has Arthur. And some versions, he's more attached to Arthur than others. But Arthur is always there to ground him. And... It's not always entirely clear why Arthur is attached to the tick. So that's a very interesting relationship. And I'm hoping maybe you can shed some light on not just what we know what it is that Arthur provides to the tick, although I'd like you to expound upon that a little bit more. But what is it that the tick provides to Arthur? What's the nature of that relationship? This is going to be some wild speculation on my part. Well, part of it anyway. Arthur, as we've established, is an accountant. And 
other than the Ben Affleck movie, when's the last time you considered an accountant to be an exciting or thrilling life? I, I'm guessing not. Uh, never. So from that standpoint, it's a great choice because the whole point of Arthur is he's supposed to be boring. He's supposed to have the most mundane life imaginable. That's not to knock anybody else that is an accountant any more than it's to knock someone that's a psychiatrist because most people think we're all crazy. So be it. Stereotypes I know exist and sometimes they develop for a reason. Uh, But the idea that someone like Arthur is necessary for the tick is pretty clear. Whether you want to talk about it from not knowing how to function in society to just having someone navigate the basics of what's expected of a human being, that makes perfect sense for the tick to need almost a a guardian. So that's fine. Plenty of people can relate to that. There are plenty of human beings that clearly are going to need assistance for the rest of their life throughout adulthood or people that didn't need it and are going to need it later, either through bad circumstances or development of illness, et cetera, et cetera. So that makes perfect sense. Your other question as to what on earth does Arthur need the tick for, I kind of hinted at. It's similar to how I've described the Joker when we did that episode so long ago. The Tick is, in many ways, the things that Arthur is not. The Tick takes chances. The Tick is impulsive. The Tick is highly emotionally responsive in a way that goes beyond anxiety. Anyone that's read Arthur as a character or seen the character the way he's usually portrayed... What does he usually say when he's in a conflict? Not the face, not not the face. face. Exactly. In other words, whatever you do, please don't harm me. He, he, He figures already that he's defeated. He's going to lose. So at least make it as painless as possible. But then who usually comes to his aid? The tick. Now, you can make the argument that would Arthur be in those situations if it weren't for the tick in the first place? Of course not. But once again, that's an opportunity for development. That's an opportunity for growth. We've had this discussion, I don't know how many times. Stagnation is death. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Arthur doesn't do that well on his own. He doesn't put himself in circumstances where he's going to develop and grow. But the tick, by definition, puts him in those circumstances. So even though he may not like it on a superficial level, he recognizes that having those opportunities with someone like that allows him to be greater than he ever would be if he had never met him in the first place. So yes, there are so many things about the tick that frustrate him. There are so many things that I'm sure he wouldn't want to deal with. And yet, I think because he gets some sort of benefit from those encounters as well as his own personality requiring him to fulfill obligations. He took on the responsibility of being the Tick's roommate, and therefore he wants to see it through. It'll create too much of a neurotic response if he doesn't, that he's going to continue to do this no matter what. In other words, I'm sure, as he's demonstrated so many times, he wants the Tick to be more independent and do the things that he would expect an adult to do. But at the same time, the fact that he doesn't, even though it frustrates him, he's still willing to, in a way, be an enabler. I'm not saying that this is all positive. I'm saying that this is the dynamic that they've created and he's willing to go ahead and continue with it because he gets the side benefit of being in novel experiences that allow him to live a more fulfilling life. So he's... So the tick is fun for Arthur and he gets to, I don't want to say live vicariously, but he gets to experience all those things that he knows he otherwise wouldn't get, but for the tick being there. Yep. Basically. Oh, you're such a free spirit. Oh, well, you're always so practical. (laughs) So the last thing, and this is something that, again, the tick is uh, 
sort of has throughout all of his iterations. He's a childlike nature in an adult world. And I think this sort of ties into the amnesia to some extent. But the idea that the tick is basically fascinated by pretty much anything. In the comics, he's fascinated by the fact that his suit has pockets. Never mind the fact that he has sort of an, a never-ending wad of $2 bills in the pockets. Just the fact that he has the pockets, he's like, it has pockets. You know, it's like a woman's dress. Like when they're yeah. there, you're like, oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Yes. And every woman listening to this goes, yes, I know exactly what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. But that, that childlike wonder, I think it's very important. And so I'm going to let you speak about it because then I have some thoughts, but I'll let you go first. Okay. Well, I think it's amazing and it's endearing and it's why people love reading or watching The Tick. It's to me, the most important thing, because we recognize children as people that have unlimited potential, and anyone that has seen a child learn something for the first time or experience something for the first time recognizes this joy, because whether it's a good experience or a bad experience... Do me a favor. If you have a young child, give him a little squeeze of lemon. Just, just do it. It's the coolest thing ever if they haven't experienced it. Okay? I'm just giving an example that's not too harmful. But my... Through the eyes of a child. Oh, my gosh. And you killed it. Anyway. I can get my friend Steve to detail your car for like 20 bucks. Uh, all right. All right. <laughs> I had South to get Park it out. for the win. I had to get it out. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Continue. The point is that it allows us to re-experience things in our life that we wouldn't otherwise be able to. For us, just about anything can become routine or in the medical field, we call things like that scut. Things that you've done so many times that you don't even have to have your full awareness of what you're doing. For some doctors, it's suturing. For someone like a psychiatrist, I know for me, it's a reflex. Whenever I even see a patient for the first time, I'm asking them, and it may not be relevant, but I'm in a hospital. Do you have any thoughts of wanting to hurt yourself or hurt anyone? And, and sometimes they're like, I'm here because I'm addicted to alcohol. Like, oh, well, sorry, have to ask. <laughs> kind of playing it off when I realized I put my brain on autopilot when I shouldn't have. The tick doesn't have that. His brain is never on autopilot. I know it sounds weird because we think of him as kind of mindless, but it's the opposite. He is so mindful of what's happening in the moment. He doesn't have to worry about the past. He doesn't have to worry about what's going to happen next or what or, or anticipate things. He simply is there for the now. And children are very commonly affiliated with making sure that their needs are met right now or, or their or their desires are, are, are clearly more important than anything else that's going on in the rest of the world. Now, that doesn't make him selfish. If anything, he's very selfless because once he's associated something that is good, like making a friend, he figures that that's the way it's always going to be. He doesn't even give consideration to the idea that people have nuance or people can, can act different ways. Having said that, don't get on his bad side as you already demonstrated when you were giving the introduction. If he thinks that you're doing wrong, he will definitely go ahead and just fight you for it. But he's not even doing it in a way usually that's meant to be malicious. He's not out for quote-unquote vengeance. He's not trying to uh, have some overarching goal for everything else in life. He just basically says, you're bad, so yeah, don't do that. And honestly, if a villain doesn't do it, then he says, okay, cool, great. And that's it. He doesn't give much other detailed thought to those circumstances. And it's a wonderful thing to see. So I don't have negative things to say about that. My concern, though, is if we see this in adults in our real lives, unless we're talking about someone with a significant cognitive impairment or, or other disability, we get a little worried because... Those are people that can also be incredibly manipulated. And that's the downside, because being naive is not that far off from being gullible. And therefore, you end up in a circumstance where 
you have to make sure that person is around the right people that are looking out for their best interests, because otherwise you're just going to end up losing everything or being in a situation where they're doing wrong things because someone told them it was the right thing. So in that sense, he could end up becoming a puppet. And that doesn't happen nearly as much because just the way the tick is written in just about every iteration, it's, in my opinion, it's not worth it to go that way. I, I don't ever want them to make it that heavy, but that is the risk. And and that's the thing that unfortunately, when it comes to people developing, not just as children, but just depending on what their upbringing was, their background, their circumstances, we see this happen far too often. So I apologize. That's the little Debbie Downer note. But the other part, like I said, in all honesty, if we were able to approach things on a daily basis, similar to the way the tick approaches them, I think we'd actually live much more enjoyable lives. There's another example that I want to give that's totally off, just, just totally random. What's the movie? Oh, my God. Is it Meet Joe Black? It's with... Brad Pitt and Anthony Hopkins? Right. Right. Peanut butter. For whatever reason, the devil just loves peanut butter. And it's like the first time he ever experienced it. He said, I think, or not, not the devil, I'm sorry, death. But he's just like, I, I, I really think I like this peanut butter. And and I don't know why I thought that was so endearing in the moment, but it's it's the same type of thing where I know I mentioned novelty before for Arthur, but just treating the world and every experience as the opportunity for a new novel synapse that's developed in your brain. I think that's a wonderful way to go through life. And it's something that we don't get. Just as humans, we really don't get to do that past a certain point. Well, I, that's what I wanted to talk about. I, and I'm trying not to sound like braggadocious or full of myself, whatever. I have tried to maintain that level of childlike wonderment as much as possible without the naivete but just the idea that there are certain things in this life that we get to experience that if if we really think about how amazing it is sometimes to to live in the time that we live in now and to get to experience the things that we we get to do it's mind blowing and if we actually sit and think about it, we become so much more grateful. And I think that's another thing that it sort of ties into, at least in the real world application of it all. And so for me, everything is about gratitude. You know, gratitude is attitude, attitude is gratitude, what have you. But so I try and take that, again, not the childlike view of things, but just the mindfulness of it and being grateful for the opportunity to experience whatever it is I'm experiencing at that point, good, bad, otherwise. And that makes me happier overall because I'm less stressed because my standards, and this is going to sound silly, but my standards for happiness are so low mm. that it really doesn't take a whole lot to make me happy. Mm -hmm. And I think so many of us collectively, we have to set our standards. Well, I'll be happy when this, 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 and this happens. And it's very difficult to achieve those goals. And therefore you're not really going to be happy. If you set your own standards for happiness at a low level, then you always surpass them. Mm. Mm. You know, you know, it's it's interesting because you just touched on something that I didn't think about until just now. Uh, I got that experience uh, just last weekend. So the NBA, I'm a big basketball fan. The NBA just had its all star weekend. And in that All-Star weekend, we ended up in a situation where the three-point contest was won on the very last shot of the, comp of the competition. Literally, the last shot was the highest score in the final round. That won. So, so throughout the contest, we were like, oh, my goodness, how is this going to end? And then the slam dunk contest featured, I'd say, two or three of the greatest dunks I've ever seen in my life. And seeing the reaction of people, including a decision that a lot of people thought was unfair in terms of the judging, it was like, I've been watching the dunk contest my entire life. It's been in existence since before I was born. And yet to get this wonderment 
after years and years and years, including hearing year after year of people saying, well, the dunk contest is dead or there's nothing else that anybody can do and seeing these things, some of which were similar to old dunks, but just saying like, wow. And you hear the crowd and you see the reactions of people like the shock looks on people's faces and all of this stuff, including people that played in the NBA having these reactions. It was like, wow, it's nice to see people responding to things that you think they wouldn't respond to anymore. And then the All-Star game where people actually were competing for charities and they would reset the score. And then it became the old school style at the end where you're literally playing to a score. So it wasn't a game clock anymore. The fact that they did that and they played so hard and everybody was on their seat like for the last free throw because the first one was missed. And it was like, oh, my God, if the other team gets the ball, they could win. You know, all of it. We've watched these games hundreds of times and for it to finally seem like oh my gosh this is real entertainment it felt that way similar to watching it for the very first time as a kid and and the fact that that can still happen is one of the greatest gifts that you can give to mankind so i don't care what it is i don't care if it's entertainment i don't care if it's in your personal life i don't care if it's your relationships i don't care if it's your job whatever it is if you can create that level of wonder novelty excitement, fun. If you can do that as many times as you possibly can in your life, then you're going to have a great life. You really are. So I think you said that perfectly. Thank you. I do like to try and have good advice or ideas from time to time. So we're going to take a short break and uh, plug some shows. When we come back, we'll get into treatment. Stay tuned. Hey, my name is Paul and I'm not an animal expert. I'm Donna, and I'm not an animal expert either. And together we do a podcast about animals called Varmints. Every week we pick an animal, do a bunch of research on it, and bring you some interesting facts about that animal. But we don't stop there. We talk about that animal in movies, TV, and other pop culture. And we talk about whether or not that animal would make a tasty dish, and how intelligent we think it is on the scale of 1 to 10. It's exactly like one of those fancy PBS nature documentaries. Except with more poo jokes. New episodes go live every Thursday wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Or you can visit us at BlazingCaribouStudios.com. <laughs> Varmints! Varmints! <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jen. Hey, Micah. Remember watching the Friends premiere? No, I never saw that. Oh, but remember those first Wu-Tang solo albums that came out? No, I don't. Remember that terrible Frasier theme song? Oh my god. Remember, I was sent away from home when I was 16, sent to like the middle of nowhere Montana, therapeutic boarding school, none of this rings a bell. Oh yeah. Join us for I Never Saw That, a podcast about mid-90s pop culture and Montana. What about ER? You saw that though, right? No! Hey, this is Cullen Bunn, and you're listening to Capes on the Couch. And we're back. So in-universe treatment, um, he already escaped from a mental institution, so mm -hmm. we know he's mm -hmm. got some issues. Mm -hmm. um, have at it, Doc. So this is going to be my laziest answer for in-universe treatment ever, because he already did it. In the episode, oh, I forgot which one, but the point is he was talking to a jar and a head that clearly was a therapist. And the idea was he was supposed to battle all of his issues. And it was a guy named Taft who looked like Shaft in different costumes. At one point, it may have been an issue with his mother. So Taft dressed it up as his mother and other things. And he just had him fight because... That's what the tick knows how to do, fight. So my thing is, we already know he has amnesia, and we know that that's not the issue, so I would just make it very simple. If it's a matter of anger, I would have someone dress up as anger, and the tick could punch him. And if it's sadness, then I would have someone dress as sadness, and the tick could punch him. And if it's, you know, something else, I would just have them put on that word and the tick would punch him. And uh, I'm pretty sure the tick would feel better about it. Because if you think you're doing anything psychodynamically involved with the tick, you're, you're, you're sadly mistaken. Just saying. All right. 
So just let him punch out his feelings. Yep. Okay. Could do a lot worse, I suppose. So... By the way, I would make sure that it would be almost like a battle room simulation. I don't want him to actually punch people. You know, that's that's not cool. So, uh, so out of universe, then, I don't even know how you'd begin to, to do that. Okay, I mentioned whatever the circumstance was, the person has a disability that they require someone like an Arthur. In other words, maybe it's someone that has a home health aid, or maybe it's someone in a group home that has staff with them. Maybe it's a, a person that's developed dementia and, and they are there with their caregiver. Maybe it's someone with a, a traumatic brain injury and, and they just, you know, need a visiting nurse once in a while, whatever the circumstance. My point is someone that unfortunately doesn't meet what we consider to be the standards that we would expect for most cognitively aware adults. And what do we do about those circumstances? So you have to make sure that you know how, first of all, I'll start with the basics. What's their communication style? Because sometimes people may not have full development of language in the way that we expect it. Is it sign language or is it simple modal yes, no? In other words, one of the most common things you can do and and really is beneficial if you don't know what else to do for someone that, for example, it looks like they can't speak is, do you lift your eyes to say yes? People don't know this, but there is the general sign for someone that, let's say, has severe cerebral palsy, can't move their limbs, therefore they can't do sign language and they don't have the ability with their vocal cords to speak or there's some cognitive impairment. Raising your eyes up for yes Raising your or lowering your eyes down for no is a very common universal language that is learned very quickly at a young age. And therefore, you can do yes, no communication. That could be the most important thing. Am I saying that the tick is at that level? Of course not. I'm just giving examples that I think could be relevant to people in certain circumstances. Because, for example, someone that's in a store sometimes may not recognize that the person has certain limitations. And then everybody gets frustrated. The person that's caring for that person gets frustrated because the employees don't know what's going on. The employee gets frustrated because they think, and, and I'm going to use intentionally provocative language, not not too too far, but you can kind of read into what I'm saying. Like, this person is an absolute idiot. What are you doing? And that's not fair to anybody. Nobody wants those types of interactions. Nobody wants those circumstances. So just establishing that as a basic level of communication can be great. Okay, from there, let's say the person, it's a matter of impulse. The person just, when they get excited, they they start jumping up and down, but they're a huge person. Let's say they're 200 pounds, a, you know, a big person because they jump up and down. They're like, you know, banging into things, causing problems like that. Well then you need to have someone that has a background in what's called applied behavioral analysis or ABA. And what that means is they know how to do trials with a person that allows them to potentially modify those behaviors so that they're not as destructive or even can be constructive. You replace one behavior with another. And this is an area that I'll admit is not my area of expertise. I happen to know someone, though, that may have an area of expertise like that. (laughs) That's my wife. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, it's a little shameless plug there. My wife uh, has a background in, in ABA, um, you know, which usually is applied more to children, but it is just as true for adults, for example, with autism. That's an example that I'm I'm thinking of right now. Got it. Um, but my point is, a lot of times it's not as as complicated or as grandiose as you think it needs to be. It's just a matter of what is going to allow this person to have at least the type of responses that are not going to be disruptive to everyone else. And then what also allows them to have a higher quality of life. Most people are still very good, whether it's verbal communication or or just, you know, very basic communication as to whether or not they like something. So if you allow them to have a circumstance where they'll get more of what they like versus what, what they don't, or at least recognize that if you do this thing, you're not going to end up with what you like, then the dynamic becomes pretty positive because they'll say, okay, I'll do more of the things that get me what I like as opposed to the things that I don't. And I'm not saying that the tick, once again, is at this level. I'm trying to equate it to something because we don't have superheroes in this world, as far as I know, that have amnesia with, you know, huge muscular bodies that act like children. I'm sorry, I'm not aware of them. I'm just trying to equate it to someone that either has problems communicating the things that they want in life, that has a childlike nature that still may end up with needs that aren't being met. That's the best I can come up with on on just thinking off the top of my head. And I'm sure I'm butchering this. So people that have greater experience or a better 
vocabulary to describe what I'm talking about, please be my guest. I, I think we need that level of understanding. Um, but I'm trying to also do this for a lay audience. So keep that in mind. I think I think you did a, a fine job. And I think our our fans certainly understand that we're not going to be able to make a one-to-one comparison for every single out-of-universe hero that, that we attempt to treat. So I think uh, I think you get a pass there. So don't don't be too hard on yourself. Well, let's uh, let's see what happens. God help us all. Um, when we get the tick on Dr. Issues' couch. Hello, Mr. Tick. I'm Dr. Issues. Why, hello there, good citizen doctor. Before we get started, I have a few questions about the answers you filled out on your intake form. I was hoping you could clarify a few things for me. Yes, I really am 400 pounds, give or take. Of course, last night I had a few too many of Thrakerzog sandwiches, so maybe I'm around 403. I couldn't find a scale in your office, though. No, that's not what I meant. Under occupation, you wrote Rubik's Cube. Have you seen this thing? I- I've been working on it for about three days. I've managed to get two colors together. I'm also missing a few of the pieces, though, so I filled them in with gummy bears. This way, if I get bored, I can have a snack. Mr. Tick, you listed 92 as your age, yet you present as early 30s, I guess. Oh, but 92 was such a good year. Clinton was elected, Whitney married Bobby, and the X-Men cartoon debuted. Yes, but how old are you? Oh, I wish I could tell you, Doctor. But I fear the many attacks from 'er ne'er-do-wells and ruffians have taken their toll. I'm sorry, that must have been difficult for you to process. Nonsense! It is a necessary byproduct of the important work Arthur and I do protecting the city. There are those who would do harm to the innocents, and punishment must be doled out regularly, like sloppy joes in a school cafeteria. Consider Arthur and I the lunch ladies of justice, with hairnets of truth and aprons of fairness. That's quite the description. You mentioned Arthur. What's your relationship like? Oh, Arthur is my best chum, and he's a swell roommate to have as well, although I do wish he could maintain a cleaner place. There's always laundry lying about and empty food wrappers. If he could clean up after me better, he'd be the perfect roommate. So who's making the mess, him or you? Arthur is fastidiously clean about his own messes. If only he could apply that same level of cleanliness to me. Why don't you clean up after your own mess? I'm afraid I don't understand your question. If you make a mess, pick it up. Come again? Do you leave things lying around? All the time. Okay, so when that happens, just pick them up and put them where they belong. I'm sorry, Doctor. I don't understand your fancy psycho babble. Stop rubbing your school degrees in my face, as though I were some dog making a mess on the carpet that you have to clean up after. But you just... <sighs> Never mind. What about other superheroes? Do you have any other friends? Several. The city is teeming with miscreants, and Arthur and I cannot defeat them all by ourselves. There's Agrippa, Roman god of aqueducts, and the caped wonder, and uh, Oedipus. Uh, thankfully, she's recovered from that vicious assault. Oh, that sounds rough. What happened? I don't want to talk about it. Okay, but if you... I said I don't want to talk about it. Fine, I understand. So let's move on to... Is that stained glass? Uh, yes. My daughter made it. It's so pretty. Thanks, I'll be sure to tell her. Oh. <sighs> As I was saying... So colorful. Yes, it sure is. Can we get back to the session? Can I have it? No, as I said, my daughter made it for me. But it's shiny. Yes, it is, but it has sentimental value. Okay. Mr. Tick, I'm getting the sense that you're not taking this very seriously. Oh, but I am serious. I definitely want that stained glass whatchamacallit. No, not that. What I'm talking about this session. I'm trying to help you become a better hero. Like Caped Wonder? Can you give me very hot vision? I'll even take lukewarm vision. It would speed up reheating leftover pizzas. And Captain Wonder is tired of me bringing him my frozen meals and asking him to heat them up. No, I mean, I'm trying to help you move past some of your issues. No, your issues. I'm the tick. Damn it, I walked right into that one. Okay, let me put it this way. Never mind becoming a better hero. What would make you a better person? I've never been asked that question. That's my job, to open up your mind to new ideas and experiences. You can do that? Well, yes, I do it all the time. Do you use a special tool or just any old saw? No, I don't actually open up people's heads. It was a metaphor. What's a metaphor? It's for jokes that reference themselves. Huh? Never mind, that went over your head. (gasps) Where'd it go? (sighs) My last question, Mr. Tick. Why do you fight crime? 
Think of the city as a dirty apartment filled with the filthiest kinds of underwear, villains like rotten eggs, and the innocent citizens like a coffee table. One of those good quality sturdy ones, the kind you'd find in a woodworking shop, not a cheap one like Wayfair. My fellow heroes and I are the cleaning crew. We clean up those pesky villains with vacuum-like precision and scrub the filth clean using our fists like mops of righteousness. Then we deposit the scum into the trash bin of jail and continue on our merry ways until the next time we're called upon. Because as long as there is villainy to muck up our fair city, the tick will be there to take out the trash. So you do know how to clean up after yourself. What? Just, just get out of here. Can I take the stained glass thing with me? Fine. <coughs> Your daughter is a shoddy craftsman. Get out. Fare thee well, good doctor. Just remember, if you are in need of any superhero help, be sure to call upon the tick. Spoon! Ah, uh, thank you, Brian. Thank you for that one. That was... That was a lot of fun. So a little peek behind the curtain. Anthony a lot of times writes these. I'll have some input. Sometimes I write them. In this case, I'm giving all the credit to Anthony. He wrote this up and he asked for, for feedback. And I really couldn't give any because I was just laughing the whole way through. So, yeah, I just uh, I just kind of got into it and it didn't take me that long to write it either. Sometimes these take an extended period of time because I'm having difficulty trying to find the voice, get to the point. But with the tick, I knew going in that there really wasn't going to be a point other than he was going to frustrate the bejesus out of you. Right. And and I can honestly say that I may not have had the exact same words, but the the whole feel of it exactly the same if I had written it. So, or if we were writing it together, I think we would have come to a very similar conclusion. So I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed uh, doing it. So that's going to wrap this one up. So I think this one, as I said, uh, was a lot more fun than last week. And I think we needed that. So coming up uh, the next couple of weeks, we've got Abe Sapien and then Yorick from Why the Last Man and then Alfred Pennyworth. All right. Because uh, Ariel loves her some bat family. Hey. Um, her her pick after that is Dick Grayson. Nice. Um, and I think b before that maybe she had. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying. To, she had Jason Todd. I yeah. know she. So basically, yeah. if if there's an episode where we're covering a member of the bat family, there's like a 95 percent chance it was one of Ariel's picks. That's quite all right with me. Everybody's got everybody's got their thing. Matt loves his thematic episodes. Aria loves the, you know, the the bat family. Yeah. I feel like Brian is is a wild card. Like he yeah, he just throws some things out there. Yeah. God bless him for it. Yeah. And Ruby, you know, Ruby likes her 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 street level stuff, the yeah. the tortured heroes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. She likes those fun characters as well. Mm -hmm. So, um so that's going to do it for this episode. As always, you can find us on social media at Capes on the Couch. You can find us basically anywhere you uh, find podcasts. If you listen to us on a platform that allows you to rate, review and subscribe, please do so. And if you leave us a review and send us a screenshot along with your address and you email it to us at capesonthecouch@gmail.com, we will send you a sticker as a way of saying thank you. So, that's basically our willow way of uh, appreciating our supporters and our fans. And you can sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com slash capes on the couch. And you can sign up at the one, three or $5 level and you can unlock some cool additional content there. So that's another interesting and fun way of supporting the show. So I think that covers about everything. Doc, you got anything to say before we leave? For once, saying that you feel blue can be a very good thing. Well said. For Doc Issues, I'm Anthony Sitko. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Capes on the Couch podcast is for entertainment purposes only. Dr. Issues is a psychiatrist, but he is not your psychiatrist and does not have knowledge of your individual situation. For any personal mental health concerns, please consult your own health care providers. For medical emergencies, please call 911 or the designated number in your area immediately. Remember that you are not alone and help is out there.